Hi everyone, so today we're looking at part three of Black Beauty. We finished part two yesterday and now we're going to move on and see what happens to Black Beauty when he was sent for sale. So he's gone to the horse fair in today's one. Um, let's have a look at what happens in this chapter. Chapter 32, chapter 32 rather, a horse fair. No doubt a horse fair is a very amusing place to those who have nothing to do. At any rate, there is plenty to see. Long strings of young horses out of the country, fresh from the marshes, and droves of shaggy little Welsh ponies, no higher than merry legs, and hundreds of cart horses of all sorts, some of them with their long tails braided up and tied with a scarlet cord, and a good many, like myself, handsome and high-bred, but fallen into the middle class, through some accident or blemish, or the sound of the wind or some other complaint. There were some splendid animals, quite in their prime, and fit for anything. There were no more pleasures in life and no more hope. And there were some so thin you might see all their ribs with, and some with old sores on their backs and hips. These were sad, sad sights for a horse to look upon. Who knows not, but he may come to the same state. There was a great deal of bargaining, of running up and beating down. And if a horse may speak his mind so far as he understands, I should say that there were more lies told and more trickly, trickery at that horse fair than a clever man could give an account of. I was put with two or three other, other strong, useful-looking horses, and a good many people came to look at us. The gentlemen always turned from me when they saw my broken knees, though the man who had me swore it was only a slip in the stall. The first thing was to pull my mouth open, then to look at my eyes, then feel all the way down my legs and give me a hard feel on the skit of the... I judged a good deal of the buyers by their manners to myself. There was one man, I thought, if he would buy me, I should be happy. He was not a gentleman, nor yet one of the loud, flashy sorts that call themselves so. He was ra a, rather a small man, but well made and quick in his, all his motions. I knew in a moment by the way he handled me that he was used to horses. He spoke gently and his grey eye had a kindly, cheery look at it. It may seem strange to say, but it's true all the same, that the clean, fresh smell there was about him made me take to him smell of old beer and tobacco which i hated but a fresh smell as if he had come out of a hayloft he offered 23 pounds for me but that was refused and he walked away i looked after him but he was gone and a very hard looking loud voiced man came i was dreadfully afraid he would have me but he walked off one or more came who did not buy mean business then the hard faced man came back again and offered 23 pounds a very close bargain was being driven for my salesman began to think he should not get all he asked and must come down but just then the grey-eyed man came back again i could not help reaching out my head toward him he stroked my face kindly well old chap he said i think we should suit each other i'll give you 24 for him say 25 and you shall have him 24.10, said my friend in a very decided tone, and not an another sixpence. Yes or no? Done, said the salesman, and you may depend upon it. There's a monstrous qual deal of quality horses. Let me try that again. Done, said the salesman, and you may depend upon it. There's a monstrous deal of quality in that horse. And if you want him for a cab work, for cab work... The money was paid on the spot. My new master took my halter and led me out of the fair to an inn where he had a saddle and bridle ready he gave me a good feed of oats and stood by while i ate ate it talking to himself and talking to me half an hour later we were on our way to london through pleasant lanes and country roads until we came into the great london the great london thoroughfare on which we traveled steadily so that would have been the, the big road going through um london at the time till in the twilight we reached the great city the gas lamps were already lighted. There were streets to the right and streets to the left and streets crossing each other for mile upon mile. I thought we should never come to the end of them. At last, in passing through one, we came to a log, long cab stand when my rider called out in a cheery voice. Good night, Governor. Hello, he cried a voice. Have you got a good one? 
I think so, replied my owner. I wish you luck with him. Thank you, Governor, and he rode on. We soon turned up one of the side streets, and about halfway up we turned to, into a very narrow street, with rather poor-looking houses on one side, and what seemed to be a co seemed to be coach houses and stables on the other. My owner pulled up at one of the houses and whistled. The door flew open and a young woman, followed by a little girl and boy, ran out. There was a very lively greeting as my rider dismounted. Now then, Harry, my boy, open the gates and mother will bring us the lantern. The next morning, they were all standing around me in the stable yard. Is he gentle, father? Yes, Dolly, as gentle as your own kitten. Come and pat him. At once, the little hand was patting about all over my shoulder without fear. How good it felt. Let me get him bran mash while you rub him down, said the mother. Do, Polly, it's just what he wants. And I know you've got beautiful mash ready for me. Sausage, dumpling and apple turnover, shouted the boy, which set them all laughing. I was led into a comfortable, clean smelling stall with plenty of dry straw. And after a capital supper, I lay down thinking I was going to be happy. So that's lovely. At the end of that one, it seems like quite a cheery chapter. And now we're going to move on to chapter 33. And if you hear barking, it's Meatloaf and Bruno running about outside. Uh, a London cab horse. Jeremiah Barker was my new master's name, but as everyone called him Jerry, I shall do the same. Polly, his wife, was just as good as a match as a man could have. She was a plump, trim, tidy little woman with smooth, dark hair, dark eyes and a merry little mouth. The boy was 12 years old, a tall, frank, good-tempered lad, and little Dorothy, Dolly they called her, was her mother over again at eight years old. They were wonderfully fond of each other. I never knew such a happy, merry family. Um, a happy, merry family before or since. Jerry had a cab of his own and two horses, which he drove and attended to himself. His other horse was a tall, white, rather large-boned animal called Captain. He was old now, but when he was young, he must have been splendid. He still had a proud way of holding his head and arching his neck. In fact, he was a high-bred, fine-mannered, noble old horse, every inch of him. He told me that in his early youth, he went to the Crimean War... He belonged to an officer in the cavalry and used to lead the regiment. I will tell you more, tell more of that hereafter. The next morning, when I was well groomed, Polly and Dolly came. Those are great names, Polly and Dolly. Polly and Dolly came into the yard to see me and make friends. Harry had been helping his father since the early morning and had stated his opinion that I should be turned out a regular brick. Polly brought me a slice of apple and Dolly a piece of bread and made as much of me as if I had been the black beauty of olden time. It was a great treat to be patted again and talked to in a gentle vo voice and I let them see as well as I could that I wished to be friendly. Polly thought I was very handsome and a great deal too good for a cab if, n if it was not for the broken knees. Of course, there's no one to tell us whose fault that was, said Jerry, and as long as I don't know, I shall give him the benefit of the doubt. For a firmer, neater stepper I never rode. We'll call him Jack after the old one, shall we, Polly? Oh, Bruno started up again. Do, she said, for I like to keep a good name going. Captain went out in the cab all morning. Harry came in after school to feed me and give me water. In the afternoon, I was put into the cab. Jerry took as much pains to see if the collar and bri bridle fitted comfortably as if he had been John Manley over again. When the cropper was let out a hole or two, it all fitted well. There was no rain check, no curb, nothing but a plain ring snaffle. What a blessing that was. After driving through... Through the side street, we came to the large cab stand where Jerry had said good night. On one side of this wide street were high houses with wonderful shop fronts, and on the other was an old church and churchyard surrounded by iron palisades. Palisades, along which means uh, fancy fencing. Inside these iron rails, a number of cabs were drawn up, waiting for passengers. Bits of hay were lying about on the ground. Some of the men were standing together talking. Some were sitting on their boxes. Meatloaf. Sorry, everyone. Meet those people. No worries. Some were sitting on their boxes reading the newspaper, and one or two were feeding their horses with bits of hay and giving them a drink of water. We pulled up in the yard.
broad-faced man dressed in a great grey coat with grey cape and grey white, great white buttons, a grey hat and a blue comforter loosely tied round his neck. His hair was grey too, but he was a jolly-looking fellow, and the other men made way for him. He looked me all over as if he had been going to buy me, and then straightened himself up with a grunt and said, "He's the right sort for you, Jerry. I don't care what you gave for him; he'll be worth it." Thus, my character was established on the stand. The man's name was Grant, but he was called Grey Grant, or Governor Grant. He had been the longest on that stand of any of the men, and he took it upon himself to settle matters and stop disputes. He was generally a good-humoured, sensible man, but if his temper was a little out, it, as it sometimes when he had drunk too much, nobody liked to come too near his fist, for he could deal a very heavy blow. So he's a nice man most of the time until he has a drink, and when he has got a bit drunk, then he... Uh, it seems to get into some fights. The first week of my life as a cab horse was very tiring. I had never been used to London and the noise and the, the hurry, the crowds of horses, carts and carriages uh, that I had to make my way through made me feel anxious and harassed. But I soon found that I could perfectly trust my driver. And when I made myself easy and got used to it, I wonder if he was having to wear blinkers. Jerry was a good as good a driver as I had ever known, and what was better, he took as much effort, much thought for his horses as he did for himself. He soon found out that I was willing to draw, to work and do my best, and he never laid the whip on me unless it was gently drawing the end of it over my back when I was to go on. But generally I knew this quite well by the way in which he took up the reins, and I believe his whip was more frequently stuck up in his, by his side than in his hand. In a short time, I and my master understood each other as well as any, as well as horse and man can do. In the stable, too, he did all he could for our comfort. The stalls were the old-fashioned style, too much on the slope, but he had two movable bars fixed across the back of our stalls, so that at night, when we were resting, he just took off our halters and put up the bars, and thus we could turn about and stand whichever way we pleased, which is a great comfort. Because if you remember when Black Beauty went to the other um, stables... He was on a slope, wasn't he? And he wasn't able to move because he was always tied up and he said it was awfully uncomfortable. Jerry kept us very clean and gave us as much change of food as he could and always plenty of it. And not only that, but he always gave us plenty of clean, fresh water, which he allowed to stand by us both day and night, except, of course, when we came in warm. Some people say that a horse ought not to drink all the night. But I know if we were allowed to drink when we want it, we will drink only a, a little at a time. And it does us a great good deal more good than swallowing down half a bucket full at a time because we have been left without till we are thirsty and miserable some grooms will do that will go home to their beer and leave us for hours with our dry hay and oats and nothing to moisten them and then of course we gulp down too much at once which helps to spoil our breathing and sometimes chills our stomach but the best thing we had here was our Sundays for rest we worked so hard in the week that I do not think we could have kept it up kept up to it but for that day besides we had time to enjoy each other's company. It was on these days that I learned my companion's history. So there we go. We'll find out all about Captain um, in the next chapter. Yeah, it's interesting that some people feel that horses don't need um, water to drink all the time. That isn't really something that we, we think of nowadays. Um, you should always have fresh drinking water down for any of your pets um, or animals. And we've always had certainly had that on when we've had horses in the past that they've always had water because if you don't give it to them they can develop a, a dry cough when they're eating their hay just for some uh, extra background information for you so we'll carry on with chapter 34 tomorrow in chapter 35 um and if you head over to purple mash you'll find the guided reading activity there for you i've seen some really great examples of um people really carefully reading and filling out their true and false questions um, very accurately some people i'd say need to take a little bit more care in reading the question making sure that they're understanding it remember you need to be rucksacking you need to be reading it understanding it and then choosing how you want to answer it um, and also it's useful to have the the text open when you're answering your questions so that you can flick backwards and forwards between them if anything has stumped you so make sure that you um, have that open on your computer or phone or wherever it is that you're doing it while you're working and I think it'll help you manage to get your um, answers correct I suppose for better much of a better word 
Anyway, we'll see you tomorrow and hopefully meet Loaf will have calmed down and stop barking at the windows. Um, stay safe, everyone. <laughs>